welcome, oh, saints of God. As we tape right now, we are in the midst of a flood in Buchanan, West Virginia. School was canceled, roads are blocked and flooded. I had to find back roads to get here. I had to go through this part of town and try to get out of town and go to try to get back into town. And, and it reminded me of the flood of the latter rain. You know, God promises an early rain and a latter rain. And I just wondered, it was like a picture in my mind as I'm coming through. What would happen if we allowed the Holy Spirit to flood our souls and our spirits with the latter rain, with the pouring down? You know, Joel prophesied in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon the sons and the daughters. Oh, these are the last days. And God is about to pour out or is beginning now to pour out his spirit in a way that we've never seen before. And as it flooded our town, it just was a reminder of how powerful floodwaters can be. To see them rise as I crossed over the Buchanan River and I could, it was, we, we remarked how fast it was just running and running and running. Oh, for the mighty rushing waters of the Holy Spirit to flood us. Amen. What a great prayer. You see, even in times like this, we can still be reminded of the wonder and power and might and promise of God. Oh, saints, can we just pray for the flooding of ourselves with the latter rain? Amen. Amen. And amen. I was laying in bed. <laughs> And I was listening to scripture. Someone read a scripture. And as I heard it, it, it was just the book of Nehemiah. I was just listening to, you know, I, I get all kinds of Bible studies or I listen to the word on, on, on my phone. I have a, a, a Bible app that just, you know, reads it out loud for me. And I was listening to a, a Bible study and they were reading Nehemiah chapter six. And I have done a whole study on Nehemiah chapter 6. In fact, I've done studies throughout the last 30 years on my ministry on Nehemiah a lot. Chapter 1, I did a whole study on chapter 6 and then through the whole book of Nehemiah. But it takes just the Spirit of God to bring something out that you've never heard before. And as I was listening to the scripture being read, I heard one little three-letter word that just lit up my spirit. So before I give you the title, I want to read the scripture, and then you'll understand the title. So I'm going to read you Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now it happened that Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall. This is Nehemiah talking. And that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gates. Then Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the place of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. What was the three letter word? Oh no. Oh no. And I thought to myself, Oh no, you don't, Satan. Oh no, you don't. And so this study is called Oh No, N O O, A O N O. Oh no, you don't. Because if you understand, I'm going to get to it, but if you understand what the enemy is trying to do here, they were trying to get Nehemiah to stop his working for the Lord and meet the enemy on the enemy's terms. Can I just preach that for a while? Can, can I just sit there for a moment? It says that Sam, the enemies, because he calls them Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies. Nehemiah calls out Tobiah, Geshem, and Sambalat as his enemies. And then it says that Sambalat and Geshem said to him, saying, saying, come meet with me, come meet with us, the enemy, in a place that we choose called Ono. And Nehemiah said, oh, no, you don't. He said, they meant to do me harm. You see, we're going to learn in this study how, how not to battle on the enemy's grounds and on his terms. Amen.
So the story begins in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year of the reign of the Persian king Artaxerxes. It was about 445 BC. And just prior to this, God had raised a young woman named Esther. Remember that whole book? He raised a young woman named Esther to the throne of Persia as queen. It's her husband, Ahasuerus of Persia, who is the Artaxerxes of the book of Nehemiah. As Nehemiah opens, Esther's husband, Ahasuerus, is, that's his Hebrew name, Artaxerxes, is his Greek name or, or you know, Persian name more so, right? Okay, so um, Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes is the king that opens the book of Nehemiah. It takes place about 150 miles west of um, the Tigris River, which is now uh, Iran. So just get pictures in your head of all of this going on. And this is where Nehemiah comes into play. Now, Nehemiah, of course, we know was a high official of the Persian king Ahasuerus, or Artaxerxes I, in the capital of Susa. Um, Nehemiah was cupbearer, remember, cupbearer to the king. Uh, he would taste everything, eat everything before the king would. He was a high-ranking official, and he had found favor, just like God always shows his servants, always so shows those who love him and honor him favor. And Nehemiah had found favor in the sight of King Artaxerxes Ahasuerus. And Nehemiah heard from one of his brothers that the walls had not been rebuilt around Jerusalem. You see... It was at this time that after the Babylonian captivity that Jews were allowed to come back to Jerusalem. Of the millions that went, only about 50,000 came back. Now Ezra built the temple. That was Ezra's job. But Nehemiah, he built the walls around Jerusalem. And there was excitement of rebuilding. He had decrees from the Persian king Artaxerxes to come back and to rebuild. He was given letters of recommendation. He was given letters that they were to give him what he needed. He found immense favor. But not everybody was excited to see the Jews return to Israel. The land of promise from Jehovah. You see, there were three primary opposers. Sanballat. Geshem and Tobiah. And they were not, not very happy about the Jews' return to Jerusalem and the rebuilding, the fortification of the temple and the wall. Hmm. You know, God's people have always faced opposition when it comes to God's work. Can you say amen? God's people have always faced opposition when it comes to doing God's work. People are rarely truly excited about God's work when they're not doing God's work. And nobody's neutral. You either defend it and pursue it or you come against it and oppose it. There are just two sides to God and God and his work and those who do the work of God, those who pursue it and those who oppose it. So let me back up a little bit to show you what has, bring, what has brought Nehemiah to this very point. You see, because the enemy has tried different schemes throughout the book of Nehemiah to stop God's work. And this is how Satan is working still today with these one, two, three, four ways that Satan opposes God's work. It could be in your church. It could be in your family. It could be in, in your witnessing, in your Bible study, it, it could be anywhere. But this is how Satan is going to oppose you. So if you have pen and paper, take these notes because you will be aware of how Satan operates. So, number one, let me read you Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Nehemiah 4, 1. So it happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. You see, the first way that Satan will attack you when you're doing something for the Lord, listen, it might be even just singing in the choir or singing a special on a Sunday morning, but the first way he'll come against you is to ridicule you and criticize you. And that's what he did. He mocked 
the Jews. It says Sambalat heard and he mocked the Jews. You know, as with most enemies, the first attempt is always to discourage the work by speaking against it. Oh, that'll never succeed. Oh, you'll never do it. Oh, that won't work. Oh, no, this. Oh, no, that. Did you hear? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. That won't work. That's what you hear a lot. You'll never succeed. That'll never be f successful. You'll never get anybody coming to that. Nobody wants to do that. Mock, mock, mock. Oppose, 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 and speaking against it. When we try to do something for God, first thing, Satan will come against you with mocking, with criticism, and speaking against you. Don't let him win. Amen? Number two. Number two. Let me read to you Nehemiah chapter 4 again. Verses 7 and 8 this time. We just read chapter, verse 1. Let me read Nehemiah 4, 7 and 8. Listen to this. See if you can pick it out. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and that the gaps were beginning to be closed that they became very angry again. <laughs> and all of them conspire to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. You see, when they can't get you, when the enemy cannot get you with his words, by just coming at you with criticisms and mockings, he will come against you in open warfare. In open warfare, enemies of truth today are angry when they see our work of God progressing and prospering. They hate it. So the enemy is determined even more to move to more extreme measures. They plotted against the workers of the city to create confusion. God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of sound mind and order and purpose, right? This has often been the pattern of the enemy. When ridicule and criticism don't work, the enemies begin to threaten with open warfare. Oh, if you do that, you, you might get sick. Or, or if you do that, you know, you, people might come against you and, and you might lose your job. Or, or you might get fired. Or you might get your, day, your, do, your pay docked. Uh, open warfare. Uh, open warfare. That's how the enemy works. But if Satan can't get you through mocking you and mocking the work and opposing your work verbally, and if he can't get to, to you by open warfare, by coming just at you, number three, see if you can pick this one out. This is Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Nehemiah 5, verses 1 through 4. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Could you figure it out? Did you find, did you figure it out? You see, if Satan can't come at you by mocking your work, why are you singing in the choir? I, who told you could sing? Don't sing a special. People will laugh at you because you don't sing very well. Or <clears throat> make your throat sore, <clears throat> give you a cold so that you can't sing on Sunday morning. <clears throat> I'm just playing, right? Then, number three, what we just read, he comes at you through the internal battles. Battles in your family. Battles in your church. Internally, you see all the, the, the first two problems, the mocking, the criticism, and the open warfare, warfare, that comes from outside of us. Outside the body of Christ. Those are open attacks that we can see coming, right? But then Satan begins to mess with people close to you. Sons, daughters, division, Friends, betrayals, lies, deceptions, hurts, hurt feelings, unforgiveness. Sound familiar? You see, Satan uses this third way to attack. He comes against us by using people close to us. Because you see, here, they were selling their... They were, 
Their sons and daughters were having to be sold into slavery so that they could pay for their taxes or pay for food and pay for grain. And so they were saying, hey, some of our brethren are, are, are rich and we're, we're, we're poor and we, we're paying them and they're making us work and it's not equal and it's not fair. And, and now there's division within. You see, it's one thing to attack us. But when it, don't attack our sons and daughters or our grandchildren, right? Oh, it's one thing to come against mature believers, but go after our children? Hmm, that's a whole nother story. The enemy doesn't ever play fair. And he will come against God's work by attacking you from within. He attacks you from without, and when that doesn't work, he starts to meddle with people close to you. Now that all leads me to this final point. And this is where God really had me. I had to show you what, what, what Satan was doing through Nehemiah, through the enemies, through Sambalat, Gershom, uh, Geshem, and Tobiah. And one, mocking, criticizing. Two, open warfare. Three, internal warfare. And here's number four. And I think of all of the places that we battle or try to battle the enemy or where the enemy comes against us, this is the place where we are losing the battle most often. Hmm. So let me read you Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3. We read 1 and 2 at the very beginning. But this is Nehemiah 6, verse 3. So Nehemiah said, I sent messengers to them saying... I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? What a great response. Do you remember what they said in the beginning in verses 1 and 2? Now it happened that Tobiah, Gershom, and Sambalat and the rest of our enemies heard that we were putting the wall together. We're, we had not completely closed it. We're doing the gates, but I'm working. And it said that Sam Ballot and Geshem sent a word to, to Nehemiah and said, Hey, leave your work. Leave the work of God and come meet us in the plains of Ono. But Nehemiah said this, but they meant to do me harm. Then he said, so I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Hmm. You see, this is what I think a lot of us do. The word is compromise. The word is compromise. Okay, I'll meet the enemy that Nehemiah could have stopped his work and said, yeah, I'll just go meet the enemy because I can appease the enemy if I stop working for a little bit. And if I stop working for a little bit, then maybe I can settle the enemy down. Maybe I can calm things down and then I'll get back to the work of God. See, that's where I think we fall and we fail. We are compromising ourselves in this world. We are meeting the enemy on his turf. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no. That's where Nehemiah refused to meet his enemies. Oh, no. And so God really spoke to my heart and said, Oh, no, we don't. Oh, no, we don't. We do not meet the enemy on his terms. Amen? We do not meet the enemy on his terms. But we compromise. Well, okay, so I'll vote for a candidate who just maybe votes one or two times for abortion, but not late-term abortion. You met the enemy on his terms. Oh, I, I, we, I'll vote for a candidate who... Whatever. You met him on his terms. Yeah, we'll go to that movie that uses the Lord's name in vain. Oh, I'll just do this to my ears. You just met the enemy on his terms. Oh, I'll lie. Just, just, just to, I just have to lie a little bit. Uh, you just met the enemy on his terms. It's called compromise. We must respond like Nehemiah. Oh, no, I won't. I will not meet the enemy on his terms. Now, if you re continue to read through Nehemiah, he had to send messengers four times to the enemy. Four times after this once. 
He had to send, send messengers again saying, I'm not going to meet you. Second time, I'm not going to meet you. Third time, I am not going to meet you. Fourth time, oh no, I'm not going to meet you. You see, we have to hold our ground. Nehemiah had to stand firm and hold his ground and say, no, 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 oh no, you're not going to get me and entice me to stop my work for the Lord just because you criticize me or there's open warfare or there's a little division within. I am not going to stop building what God has for me to build in this life in his name. Oh no, you don't. Amen. You see, we can never meet the enemy on his terms. This gives him the advantage every time. So you ask, well, what are our terms? Let me show you two scriptures. These are our terms. Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed the principalities and powers... He, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. You know, what, you know what my terms are? Jesus won. Jesus won. No matter what you do, I know Jesus won the victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. He always leads us through triumph. Amen? Always leads us through tri to triumph through Jesus Christ. Always, always, always. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Romans 8. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We are overcomers. Oh my. Those are not the enemy's terms. Those are God's terms. Let me show you one more. Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 17, 14. These, the enemies, make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb overcame them, for He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. That's how I battle on God's terms. I am not going to meet the enemy in Ono. Oh I am not going to meet him where he wants. I'm not going to come down from my work. I'm not going to come away from what I'm doing for God. I'm going to keep teaching and preaching and singing and worshiping. I am not going to let the enemy take me off of my purpose for God in this world to meet him in Ono. We can't do it, church. We can't do it. Amen? We just can't. I'm going to battle... And say, those who are with him, that's me, are called, chosen, and faithful. Hmm, my little peacock feathers just want to out. Not because I'm anything, but because he is everything. And he is victorious over death hell, sin, and the grave. He has already triumphed, and the enemy can only try to entice me away from the place of victory, which is where? On God's terms, not in oh no. So the next time you are tempted to just pack it in, the next time sin comes to tempt you, the next time you, 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 you know Satan is scheming against you, even in open warfare, can you just say this? Oh, no. Oh, no. I will not meet you. Oh, no. On your terms, Satan. <laughs> I just feel the Holy Ghost all over that. I just feel the Spirit all over that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Amen. And praise God. Listen, despite the best or worst efforts of the enemy, the work continued for Nehemiah. And do you know that they completed the wall in only 52 days? We can't get a house built. We can't get a shack built in 52 days because of everything going on. But they built an entire wall around Jerusalem in only 52 days. To do it is incredible. To do it in those conditions is amazing. To do it in 52 days under those conditions is only miraculous. Yet that is what happened. You know, Satan never bothers half-hearted people only doing a little bit for God. But those really working, he just wants to come against. You know, Satan means adversary, and that's what he is. 
God never promised, God never promised Nehemiah that it was going to be easy. On the contrary, he promised that there'd be opposition. He, there'd be opposition and persecution. But here's what God promised, that we can be victorious, victorious if we remain faithful despite opposition, persecution, and warfare. Because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Mm. What an amazing message. What an amazing word. Not me, the word. What God just spoke. Listen, you might have ridicule and criticism. You might have open warfare. There may be some internal struggles in committees and churches and pews, right? But we can never compromise. We just can't do it. We're a church of in-between. A church of a lot of lukewarm. Oh, church. Can we just say, oh no, not me. I will not meet the enemy on his terms ever again. Amen, amen, and amen. Listen, if you don't know the one who won the victory, will you let us introduce him to you? His name is Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our Messiah, the one who died on the cross to save you. And he loves to lead you in victory. And he wants you to be his and he wants to be yours. He's painting this amazing, beautiful picture of you and him together, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you.